what I'm going to do today is uh, really talk a little bit about um, what does it mean to think about performance and what are the things that influence it? How do we get it? And it's really important for us to uh, get a fairly good gr a grasp of how things work. There is a saying that we should often spend the time understanding things one level below the level of, level of abstraction that we work with. Because if we don't, we then often get really confused and uh, we really uh, don't get the results when we need to get the results and it can be very frustrating. And we may also be ending up spending a lot of time and effort solving the wrong problem. So oftentimes people talk about a couple of different things. You probably had some people say that they use React because it gives good, really good performance. And then you probably hear people say they decided not to use React because it doesn't give good performance. Uh, there was a, a few um, uh, clickbaits years ago from big companies that said, we removed the React and improved performance. These are the worst kind of click clickbaits because people read a, a heading like that and they're like, oh my gosh, they removed React and they got better performance and they click on it. Especially people who don't like a technology will, will then promote those links uh, without really asking the question, why? What, what, what was the problem? Another thing to keep in mind is almost never, I, I never trust benchmarks. The reason I don't trust benchmark is not because those benchmarks are a problem. It is because those situations may not exist for me. This is, let me say, say something absolutely stupid as a crude analogy to it. You see somebody sitting, a stranger sitting next to you in the, on the train, and you're curious, and you look at what pill they are taking, and you want to go buy that pill and take it. That's kind of like using a benchmark from somebody else, right? You don't know what the person's you know, reason for taking that pill is. Even worse, you may say, that person is good looking, maybe that's why they are, so I need to take this pill. I don't know how dangerous this can be, right? Uh, Dave Thomas, the pragmatic programmer, once told me, he said, the worst book you will ever read is the medical enc encyclopedia, he said. I said, Dave, why do you say that? And he said, because the minute you start reading it, you think that every disease they discuss is that what you have. So we need to be very careful at looking at solutions in general. Let's start with an initial code with a performance issue. Oh, before I go that route, let me emphasize this. The most important question about performance I want to emphasize, and I cannot emphasize this enough, the most important question about performance is not if the code is fast. You never want a code, well, almost never, you don't want code that is fast. You want the performance to be adequate. So first ask the question, how fast do you want it to be? Then ask the question, is it fast enough to meet that goal? If you don't ask how fast it should be, and if you want it to be the fastest, what's going to happen is you're going to put all that effort in squeezing the speed out of it. But in doing so, you compromise on many other things that are essential, but you won't be able to attain it. So for everything you want, there are other things you won't be able to get. So what you want better be worthy of it. And that's why I want to emphasize, don't jump on this without thinking and ask the question, is this really important and is it adequate? Now, having said that, let's look at an example of a piece of code that we are going to look at here with a bit of a performance issue in it. So I have a sample code. I'm going to do npm install over here. And let's just run it, first of all. We'll take a look at the code after that. I wrote this code using uh, class-based React components, but you can use functional components for this as well. It doesn't matter which way you go. The concepts are really the same. So in this case, um, I'm going to run the application uh, to begin with, if you will, before we go any further with this. So I'm going to build the code first of all. And, and once I build it, I'm going to just leave it build, building in the, in the side so we can take a look at it. So let's do a, a npm 
run build. I'll, I'll just leave it on the side. So I want to be able to run the code and take a look at it. So npm start will start it. So you can see the application started up. And I intentionally created this in a way that you will notice it. Now, I want you to, in your mind, and even loudly if you want to, I'm going to say click, and then just say in your mind or loudly, which is convenient, 1001, 1002, 1003, so we can know how long it takes to see the response, right? So here we go. So here is the load button, click. How much was it? Five seconds? It felt like more of a eight seconds for me, but five, I will take it still. Five is good. So it took about five seconds, right? So let's try this one more time. So here you go. Click. What was that? About eight seconds, right? Five to eight seconds, right? Is that good or bad? Don't say it depends. <laughs> Actually, it does depend. So is it great? That we know, no, no, not really, right? OK. Now, notice all these lines, 3 colon 2, 4 colon 2. I'm going to say click, and it's going to put a dot on those lines, right? Here we go. Click. You see that click up here? Again, let me try this. Look at this here. here. Right? So here we go one more time. Click. Three seconds. Right? Three seconds. Good or bad? Depends. Is it great? No. That's a question you want to ask. Is it adequate? Is it adequate most of the time? It depends on specification. If you develop it for me, it's more than adequate. Right? Grandpa is using this code, don't worry about it. Right? But if you have my grandchildren use it, they may not like it. Right? So, question is, how do we, if, if it's not adequate, but with respect to the performance, a couple of things to think about. 250 milliseconds is the, is the time humans really need to perceive that something happened. If your action is faster than 250 milliseconds, it will appear instantaneous. An example, how many of you have seen the blades of a fan? One person has seen it. I hope everyone in the room, right? Have you ever looked up in a room? <laughs> Everybody has seen it, right? Yeah, thank you. I'm like getting worried. But how many of you have seen the blade of the fan when the fan is running? That she is the super girl in the room, right? But everybody else, we don't see the blade running when the fan is running, right? Because that's too fast for our eyes to keep up with. But the fan is running. Maybe you turn off the fan. After a few minutes, you're just watching it. And then you can see this blade go around, round, round, and then come back to a stop, right? Then you turn it on. You start seeing the blade go. And then, and then all you see is a circle around. You don't see those blades, I hope, right? If you do, that's called paranormal, right? You got some superpowers. That's OK. Be, be proud of that power, but put it to good use. Um, so the point really is 250 milliseconds is the delay we need. This is one of the reasons why they tell us when you drive a car, uh, at least in countries other than India, this is a rule. Uh, I never can use traffic examples in this country, right? A few years ago, I came with one of my friends, and he decided to bring his uh, mom and dad with him. And this mom and dad rarely left the US in their life. So the first time they're traveling abroad. And so we're sitting at the hotel and having a nice meal. And uh, my friend's dad said, well, since I've come to India, I've become spiritual. And I said, sir, that's not unusual. India is a spiritual country. So I'm not really surprised you said that. He said, no, 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 no. You need to understand why. And I said, OK, why? And he said, every time I get into a car, I start praying for my life. <laughs> I, I can understand that, right? So, but anyway, in general, though, the rule is 
They tell you to keep a two second delay between you and the car in front of you. And uh, you know, these days, a lot of us are driving electric vehicles with uh, driver support, as they call it. So in my, I have an uh, electric truck, I, I drive a pickup, and what I like about it is I'll turn on a button on it, and it says, okay, I'll keep the distance from you and the car before. And, and if they hit the brake, my truck automatically hits the brake and you know, maintains the distance, right, which is nice. But, but the two second rule exists for a reason. You're driving on the road, and uh, this is assuming you're not on the cell phone, they hit the brake, by the time you know they hit the brake, 250 milliseconds have gone. Now your brain sends a signal through your foot and says hit the brake. And, and again, a few milliseconds have gone, and then physics comes in, and your car has to address you know, friction and apply the brakes, it's gotta slow down. That's why the two second delay rule exists. Now in a web application, if you are going to make a change, if it happens within 250 milliseconds, your users think, wow, this application is wicked fast, right? On the other hand, if the application takes about half a second, the user begins to notice the difference. They may not know, but they begin to. They click on it, and, and just a little pulse from their brain says, is it not? Oh, okay, there it is. So they are just beginning to think maybe it's not working. A second delay goes by. The user is like, I think this app is not working. Two seconds is called eternity. At the end of two seconds, your user is like, I'm done. I think this app is not working. I'm going to quit. I'm going to retry. I'm going to hit the browse, uh, re refresh, whatever they do. So one of the things you want to think about is, how can you be responsive in an application? So what does it mean to be responsive? Being responsive doesn't mean you return the entire response. You are telling the user that, yes, I heard you. I'm working on your request, and I'm going to come back with the result as soon as I can. Not in those words, obviously. But so when a user clicks on it, what if your button changes to a disable? Well, at least the user doesn't click on it twice. Have you ever done this? You click on a button, and did I click on it or not? And now you're going to click on it again. I always get nervous when that click first click was a payment I, I just made. I'm not even kidding with you. I made a reservation for a flight. And thank goodness, I went to look at it again. On the same flight, I had three seats. I'm like, gosh, that's how they, they invented cloning, right? What, hi, Venkat. Hi, Venkat, right? Three people on the same flight. How did that happen, right? So you always get nervous. What's going to happen when I click on this button? So you want to disable it, show the user that, yeah, you did click. Maybe you want to give a little nice, you know, animation to show that you're processing. But that is a feedback for them to know that a computation is being performed. Otherwise, they're kind of wondering, is this going to happen? If your application is really fast, that's great. But sometimes it may not be in your entire control because you may have a network traffic that's really high. It may take a little, a little bit of time. But nevertheless, in this particular case, that was a quite a bit of a delay. When we clicked on a load, that was an eight second delay. And for most practical applications, that's probably not gonna be adequate. So what do we do? But the more question, important question is, why? Why was that really that slow? What caused it? Right? That's what I wanna answer to begin with. So we'll get to that in just a minute right now. So let's take a look at why it was taking that long, and, and then we'll come back to it. So I'm gonna go back here and, and run the code from here, we'll do that. But I want to really take a look at the code here. So let's take a quick peek at the code. So here is, again, I've written this code very crudely just to get to the point in here. Oops, wrong button to press, pardon me. I, I really used a, a, a crude uh, example here to uh, show, make the point. So let's go back and take a look at the code. Like I said, it's a class-based component I created. You would not write code like this in reality. You wouldn't dump everything in here, but I just want to get to the example. So here's the constructor where we have the props. Super props, I have a rows, which is 10,000, columns, which is 25, and I got a state, which is the data. Then I say constant data is empty for all the rows 
and for all the columns, push the data into the row. Now, just for your purpose, right? So notice we push the data into that particular data object. But in here, if I were to put a console log here and take a look at when it happened, you will notice this happens relatively soon. But then when you call the set state, what's going to happen? When you call set state, you're sending an asynchronous request to React to take the data in the data object and put that into the state. And that causes re-rendering. And when you re-render, React is going to say, I have a virtual DOM and I have a real DOM. So the way React works is, is, is like this. Let's take a silly example. Imagine the fingers on my hand are elements, HTML elements, and maybe what I want to do is, I want to paint my index finger. I like to paint my fingernails, so I paint my fingernail, maybe the index finger. But I want to remove the thumb. The way I'm going to do this is I'm going to create a virtual DOM. In the virtual DOM, I paint my index finger, I remove the thumb, and I say, go update. So now React says, oh, look, your pinky is the same, I'll keep it. Your other two fingers are the same, I'll keep it. Oh, your index finger, I see there's an attribute on it, which is painted nail, and it changes the attribute. Oh, look, you removed your thumb, I'll, I'll dispose it. Similarly, if you were to add an element, it'll add it, remove an element, removes it, and so on. So this is wicked fast, or supposed to be. But now think about it. React is supposed to be fast. Well, we use React, then why is it taking eight seconds? And the answer to that question is, you create a virtual DOM, and here's the real DOM. The real DOM is totally empty. When a real DOM is empty, and your virtual DOM is huge, there is nothing you can do to React for it to give you better performance. This is unfair to tell React, you need to give me better performance, and React says, look, I can give you better, it's kind of like telling an airplane should move at 500 miles an hour. And then you sit there by the runway and say, it's not moving at 500 miles an hour. You're crawling. In fact, you had a truck push you. Well, it's, it's not even warmed up, so to say. So when a React is, when a, when a DOM is filled up, React can potentially give you performance. But when a DOM is empty or if the change is so drastic to the DOM, you're not going to get performance out of it. I'm not saying you cannot get performance. I'm saying you cannot get performance out of that, right? React is not going to help you at this point. We'll talk more about this in a few minutes. So then when I, so this is what I do when I load. So when I click on the button to load, what am I doing when I, when I ask it to load it? So here are the functions to load. So, so the function to load, what it says is, it says, I am going to take the load button and I'm going to call the init, great. Now, I am going to take an element that I have in the DOM. And for that element, you can see here is the element that is being displayed. And when you click on it, I click on and I call change row. What does change row say? Change row says, update the data and then call the set data. Good news and bad news, right? What's the good news? You have all these rows already filled up. You click on a row, React does not have to touch any of those rows, right? Because the data did not change on those rows. React doesn't have to touch any of these rows. This is the only row React has to change. So that's a good news. That's one slice it needs to change. React will go walk through the entire hierarchy again, but it'll keep saying, no change, no change, no change, ah. No change, no change, no change. So that change, that's the only thing it needs to update. That's why you didn't see it to be eight seconds. It was three seconds. Maybe adequate, may not be adequate, right? Depends on the context. But what if it's not adequate? We still have problem to fix, and we need to worry about it, right? So how do we deal with it? That's a question you want to ask. So that's why you see the difference in performance between the entire thing being loaded beginning and that one row changing because the DOM is warm, so to say, when you're trying to change one row, whereas the DOM is not warm when you initially load. Fair enough?
That's the first part. Okay, so there are two issues that we saw being exhibited here. And the first is, the initial load suffers from the time to render. The uptake time suffers from time for React to match the changes. So the second is where hopefully you can find a React solution. For the first one, I don't know how you can solve the problem using React. You need to think, think about this beyond that. What can we do to improve this performance? Before we jump into the performance, you can profile it. You can use tools to measure how much time a piece of code is taking to execute. You can use some kind of a profilers. You can use tools that can measure. But as it turns out, one of the things you can actually do is if you were to go to most of the browsers, right? Most of the browsers. In, in most of the browsers, you can use a certain tools to measure this already. Let me see if I can move this around a little bit to show you. So, so most of the tools you can use, so window dot performance. So most browsers have this. And what you can do is, I'm not suggesting use this all the time, but there are times when you may want to know the time it takes between two parts in your code. And you can go to the window.performance and you can perform a, a, a check mark. You can say mark the time. It's like, okay, started. Like a stopwatch, right? Click. I'm going to listen to how much time you take. Click. Oh, you took six seconds. So mark. And then you can run your code and then you can call mark on the code again and you can measure the time it took between the two points. This is especially useful if you are trying to see how much time it's taking on a browser or different browsers, the time it takes for a DOM activity to see a change, those can be used really nicely. If you haven't had a chance to do so, I encourage you to take a look at a lot of these different functions available under performance. So you can see you have a method like clear marks, clear measure, you have a get entities, you have a mark, you have a measure, you have now to tell you the time when you're calling that. And similarly, you have a few other functions that, uh, let's see what else is there. Yeah, so timing. So these are really interesting things you can use. They're part of the browser itself, including other tools you may use to measure performance. But going back to this, one, so you can use these tools, but one approach you can generally take is, I am of the opinion that better quality code can give us better performance. Or at least better quality code makes it easier to improve performance when we know it. But I'll share with you two stories related to this. I was at a client site, we were programming in Java, but one of the colleagues I had was a huge Python fan. And he would be sitting and coding Python in the same room as we were programming Java, which was really annoying to watch him, but still. But he was a good guy, so we let him in the room. And so he would be sitting and coding, and one afternoon, as me and my colleague were programming in Java, he came and sat down, and I could hear a thud as he sat down. And I looked at him, and his face was red, he was furious. So I looked at him and said, having a hard day at work, Paul? And he, no, I just came from this other room and those guys are writing bad Python code. I mean, this guy loves Python and he gets angry when somebody writes bad Python code. They're writing bad Python code. I said, yeah, that kind of happens sometimes. And then he said, let me ask you, Venkat, he said. I asked them why they're writing such a terrible Python code and they told me they had to write the code that way for performance. Do you agree with it? And I said, well, I won't answer the question, but does the code actually have good performance? Because that's the problem, it doesn't. And now we cannot even change it because it's a complete pile of mess. So I'm of the opinion, those who sacrifice quality to get better performance end up getting neither. So if you think you can get performance by writing poor quality, you're not going to have both of them. 
generally speaking. That's one thing to keep, uh, keep in mind. But a more humbling experience I would never forget. I implemented a certain feature on my product, and when I finished it, I'm a big fan of writing automated test, unit test, wrote it, and did it work? Absolutely. And you can ask me, how did it perform? Beautifully. I would try it out, boom, boom, boom. I get responses, happy, right? Ship it. And the code worked extremely well. You know why? Because we had no users. Fast forward two years. We have a lot of data accumulated from users by now. So one day I literally got a support call and the person said, do you realize that a click on this page takes 15 seconds to respond? I'm like, oops. And I went and ran it and sure enough, it is taking 15 seconds to respond. And I'm like, okay, I'm on it. And I remember this was a you know a early Saturday, so the entire family is sleeping. I'm like, let me fix this bug. And it was a very humbling experience. I'll be absolutely honest about this to you. So what did I do? I said I got into the performance. I took the code related to that particular thing, and I had written beautiful code. And I said to myself, I know where the performance problem is. This is using this functional style code. Boom, change it to imperative because it's going to give better performance. Oh, that one, this one, this one. And in, in, an, in, a, in an hour and a half, I tore apart the code and made it ugly. And then I ran the code. And now, what took 15 seconds to run, now took 15 seconds to run. I looked at this and said, what a shame. No difference other than wasted one hour. I'm not kidding with you. I took a deep breath, deleted the change, brought back the original code. And I said to myself, let me understand the problem. And I said, what a novel idea. Sometimes you do this, right? You're like, oh, here's the problem, here's the solution. No, did you even think about the problem? That's what I didn't do. Because I was convinced where the problem was, and I was wrong. Very humbling experience for me. I said, let me understand what the problem is. And I literally started profiling the code right now with the beautiful code I had written. Function after function after function that I suspected poor functions. I wrote an apology letter to each of those functions afterwards, right? Yeah, they're all fine. Except one function literally took almost all of that 15 seconds, just one function. I'm like, whoa, everything above it is fast. Everything after it is fast. That one line, woo, woo, right? And you're like, that pause, oh, what is that function? Now I'm doc reading the documentation for that function, right? And I'm not even kidding with you. Once I profiled it, it took me exactly five minutes to understand what was wrong with that function. Changed a little bit of a setting, reran the code. What took 15 seconds to run took less than 33 milliseconds. Lesson I learned the hard way. Don't solve a problem without analyzing and understanding it. This, this belief in our mind, somehow, if you do good practices and write good quality code, maybe you won't get performance. I fell into the trap myself. I was convinced that's the case. And it was not. So sometimes doing good things in as far as code quality can give us results. One of that is componentizing. If you componentize, you might get better performance. How? Let's look at the code we have. Notice the, what the code is doing. The code says, I am going to create this entire data. And when I finish creating this data, I'm going to stick that into the state and say, go. What does this component do now? The component is dealing with uh, all the rows and all the columns. This is a stupid example, right? But instead, think of a realistic case where you have to represent a, a table of data. Maybe there are cities 
and maybe there are temperatures and pressures and humidity and what have you that you want to display. So your component says, I got all the cities and all the properties, I'm going to display it. Here's my table. Or it could be an application where you're displaying stock data and you got a lot of stocks and different data. What was the lowest price, highest price, current price? What was the trend? What was the highest price in the year, lowest price in the year, year-to-date value, whatever that could be. If you do all of that in a component, your code is not easy to manage. I would argue that's a poor quality code in the first place, independent performance. But what can I do to make the code better? I would want to, if you will, componentize it, which is a better way to write the code, isn't it? So what do I want to do in here to improve that code? So I have, as you can see, created a row right now. This is a component I created just now called row. And the row component says, I will contain details of one row. That's it. One row at a time. This row, change row, is going to modify the content of that row alone and re-render it. That's, that's all it's going to do. So that's my row. What does my app do right now? My app says, when I change the state, one state at a time, I'm going to now render, so set state, but what are we rendering here? A row at a row, row at a time, right? Right there, one row at a time. So we are component, just one step of componentizing, that's all we did. So we took the app, and we divide into rows. So every, through the loop, rendering one row at a time. What does a row do? The row renders its own HTML. That's all we did. What could be the benefit, you may wonder, right? Is there a, is there a big gain for doing so? So let's go back here and do a npm start, see if there's any change. So I go back and click. Now, that shouldn't change anything, right? Because as we argued, you know, discussed earlier, React uh, is not going to help you a lot over there in that case. So right here, and I want to make sure that this actually got back the proper change. So bear with me for a second. I'm going to just make sure this is recompiled. Re uh, and, and I want to make sure we got the correct um, uh, one we are looking at. Easy to end up running the wrong things. So I'm going to... Let me blow this away. Okay, so npm run build. Just run this again, npm start. So, execute it again. Let's take a look at it. So, this time we componentized it into break that into smaller components. That's what we did, right? So, going back, click. Not a whole lot of difference, right? So, sometimes they're like, oh, I expect it much better now. Click. Maybe, maybe a little bit, just a little bit maybe, not too much noticeable. Then you can think about one other thing. React has a few interesting features. But first of all, by componentizing it, one advantage you're going to get is React may decide to render a set of child components and not re-render a set of child components. Even though there was a bit of a performance improvement, may not have seen a great improvement. But one thing you can also do is you can use an idea called React Memo. And a memo stands for memoization. So the idea of memoization is, so first of all, if you are using class-based components, in class-based components, you have a should component update function. So these are two different ideas with the, with a similar expected result. Should component update is a function you write on class-based components. The should component update will return a true if the component should be re-rendered. It returns a false if the component doesn't have to be re-rendered. So when you click, I know what you clicked on. For the rows that did not change, I can return a false. For the rows that you that are changing, 
I cannot run a true. So now React can say not check, 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 update. It can say skip, 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 update. So it doesn't have to go through the hierarchy and check through them. That's the benefit you're going to get. So that is an example of how you can use a, a feature to improve the performance. So let's take a look at the code before we go any further with this. So here is the, is the component, but uh, the row component, but I have a show, a should component update. And the should component update says, if the row for the property is not equal to the row in the state, if it is equal, return a true, otherwise return a false, right? So it can simply say, tell me what is modified, what's not modified. So this gives a hint to React whether it should be re-rendered or not. The rest of the code is the same as it was before, no different. And, and so is the code in the app, right? Not very different. So with that change we made, let's take a look at what's going to happen right now. I run the build. I'm going to go ahead and run the application. We'll do a start and fire it up and, and the load. So once we load the application, Let's take a look at what's going to happen right now. So there it is. So here we are. Let me do a, a, a there we go. So let's do a click. Was that faster? Let me try again. Click. How much time did, did that take? Under one second. It was pretty, pretty fast, right? I didn't do a whole lot in here. I just componentized it. That itself is useful most of the time, but in addition to componentizing, I say should component update. Well, if you're creating a functional component, you don't have should component update. For that, you can use react.memo. So what in the world is memo? I'm sure you're familiar with the concept of memoization, right? So what is not memorization, memoization. So what is memoization? Memoization is where a result of a computation is stored and the result is used instead of performing the computation the next time you call it. So that's basically what memoization is. So you have a function you're calling and the function executes and gets you a result. You store that result and return the result the next time the function is called, you say, wait, is the input the same? Yeah. Well, then don't bother running it. Just give the result back. This only works if the function is pure. If the function is not pure, this doesn't make sense to do. Well, with the components, functional components are pure. That's the nature of functional components. So because functional components are pure, you can take the result of them and you can memoize it. So what React does is, if you say memoize, it, when the function is rendered, if there is no change, it would just render what has been pre-rendered. It won't re-render the function itself. It'll just use the pre-rendered uh, virtual DOM. So you can do that as well. So that gives you really nice uh, benefit. So you say, all right, that's great. Good news. In this particular application, I have the performance of these elements and I'm going to go back here and click on it and that was almost instantaneous so yay do I want to break them into smaller components like should I create a row with columns in it and the answer to that question is focus on your design not on your performance if your design will benefit from creating a component for the cells Go for it. If you have enough complexity to it, and if your code becomes more manageable. If your domain granularity is a row, then a cell, then stick to the domain granularity, unless you really need to bring it down for performance reasons, right? So, so your design of your, based on your domain should rule before what you do for your application. You say, okay, that's cool so far, I'm happy with it, but there is one other problem. If I look at this application, I click on the two that was instantaneous, click on the three that was instantaneous, 
But when I start the app, maybe my application is really slow. When I click on load, I did click on load already. And eight seconds later, that popped up. Even worse, if you didn't have a load button, a lot of times you don't. You make a request, and you got this blank space for a long time, and boom, something appears, right? What do you do? That's not acceptable. Why not? Because that's not a great user experience where they see a blank. But a more important question you want to really ask, does the user need all the data to be seen? If you have a lot of data, the chances are the user is going to see a lot less. So we need to seriously think about how do we structure our applications? Let me, let me say this a little differently. A lot of us have been developing web applications for a long time. This is not new, right? We've been developing web applications for a long time. When devices came about, when we started seeing things like iPad and, uh, uh, and Android devices, what is one difference between developing a web app and developing a mobile app for the same application. The biggest difference is, this is a beautiful thing to think about. When, a lot of us don't like constraints, right? If I tell you I'm gonna limit something, you're gonna say, oh my gosh, please don't. Constraints are great. There is a fantastic book, but a very frustrating book. The book is called Dreaming in Code. And Dreaming in Code is a book written by a gentleman who worked with Mitch Kapoor. And this was a project he started. He was a you know, billionaire. And he said, I got a lot of money. And I'm going to create an application. And guess what he did? He hired the best team in the world. He hired the entire Mozilla team. So you're like, hey, do I have the best programmers in the world? Got it. What about budget? There's no bottom. You can have as much, as, much, as much money as you want. What about time? No deadlines. I see the face of smile up, right? Hey, where can I sign up for that project, right? No deadlines. No budget. No deadline, and you and and so and 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 no limits on capability. And what would you say? You would say, Venkat, that's great pathway to success, isn't it? And the project failed miserably. Why? Because people like, when do you want, when, when should we do it? Whenever? How long should we take? Take your time. What should we build? Build whatever, as long as it's spectacular. And whom can we rely on? Anyone in the world you want, you can hire them. And they never did anything. When you want to be given things, but not to the abundance where you lose value to it, but just a little bit, and you know, now you're like, oh my gosh, I better pay attention to it, right? So in this case, the device has thought as an important lesson. The device has said, you don't have a lot of space. I'm like, oh, gosh, what can I present here? Now you're rethinking. What minimalistically should I give to the user? How can I present more information to the user when they need it? Well, of course, we are not dealing with a mobile application now. It's a, it's a browser, right? So the question is, what can we do in this case? The first realization is, a user doesn't need to see all the data. A lot of times, they, I mean, I have to complain here. I am not a fan, I'm a fan of Amazon when they deliver the product. I'm not a fan of Amazon website at all. I go there, they have everything I don't need and nothing of what I need. I never look at the page, right? I go to the, type this in, see that, buy, you're done. And most of the time I ask my kids to buy it, that's even better. 
And they love it because they, in, in my name of buying, they buy other things too. It's a good deal. But the point is, that is what I don't want an application to be, right? Where everything is given to me that I don't care about. So one of the things you can do here pretty nicely is this idea of maybe presenting a little and then presenting a little bit more. This is the beauty of infinite scrolling. So infinite scrolling as a concept is brilliant. You go to a page, it shows you some data, and a user is like, this is good, I'm happy, I don't need anything more. You can leave. Or you say, oh, here is the data I see, but I really want a little bit more. You scroll, it pulls the data and gives it to you. And you scroll, it pulls the data and gives it to you. Now you can mix React and infinite scrolling together. How so? So in the beginning, if you remember, we had nothing on the DOM. And the virtual DOM was this. So you went to React and said, React, here you go. Here's the virtual DOM. Go for it. And React is like, oh, I got to go from this to this. Your browser is spending the time populating and manipulating the DOM. So all the time is wasted in your browser trying to respond to it. But instead you say, here is my total content potentially. But when an application shows up, I'm not going to give this virtual DOM. I'm going to give this, just this part. And say, here you go. And React is like, oh, sure, update. So that's all it contains, right? When the user scrolls, you give this part. Now React says, oh, I already have this, but I got to add this part. I'll add it. You are amortizing the cost incrementally. Did you shorten the overall time? No. But you chopped up the time. You're giving a breather along the way. And the user is so happy when they see the data, right? And then they say, scroll, oh, there you go. Scroll, oh, there you go. So this is not a direct React technique, but it's nevertheless a technique where you can leverage infinite scrolling uh, to achieve the result in this particular case. So let's take a look at how we can, we can do this. So here is the row. No difference to the row that you saw earlier. Here is the app. But notice what the app says. The app says, here are the rows, here are the columns, but I got a page. Where a page has a thousand elements, that's it. Shown is zero. Again, don't take this literally. The idea is what is important, not the implementation in this case. But then what I do is I say, go from shown to a shown plus page size, that next chunk, and add the data and push it to the data. So you already have some data, and there's a new data that you're adding. You are simply re-render the state right here. Now, I say in reality, data will come from the server. We can make a request for each chunk, and as it comes, we can render it. But in this case, I say, go ahead and render the initial chunk. And then, of course, as time goes on, I say, if this dot shown is less than this dot row, Excuse me, go ahead and render the chunk. So then, the rest of the code is pretty much the same as what was before. So you're rendering the data in chunks every time, right? That's what you're doing. What's the benefit of this approach, you may wonder? Let's go back and try this again. So I'm going to go back to the application. So here we are. Click. Oops. Try that again. Click. Was it better? But of course, you know the story, right? It is better, but it didn't have all the data. So I scroll down. Scroll down. You saw that? Little blank page. Scroll down. And the performance is adequate, but not because we used React. It's because we use Sense. And that's the key, right, to ask the question. What is it that we are dealing with? So if you take a large amount of data, going back to the statement I made earlier, 
about this large company that said, we got rid of React and we gained performance. It's like my grandma saying, I got rid of my car and I saved so much money. I said, grandma, do you know driving? She says, no. I said, do you go anywhere? No. Then why the heck did you buy a car? That's what they did. They used React but had no reason to use React. So clearly, if I buy something, use something I don't need, and I throw it away, I'm, I'm going to have better performance. Why? Because your overhead was loading the stuff you didn't need. That's like grandma spending money on the garage to park the car that she never needs. That's the whole point, isn't it? So we need to ask the question, what are we really solving? And so it's not about the tool. It's not about using a particular technology. It is about really asking the question, what problem are we trying to solve? In that regard, I would even go to the extent of saying, I always you know, tell my developers when I work with them, don't decide your framework. Don't decide your technology from the architecture point of view early, too early on. Because if you do, you are trying to commit to something before you understand what you are actually building. I mean, seriously, I don't have any disrespect for any technology. I'm just giving you this as an example. I have a client here in India that I was talking to a few months ago. And I asked them, I had the opportunity to talk to different teams, who each of which was doing different things in the company. But for every team I went to, I would say, what do you use? Spring and Angular. Another team, what do you use? Spring and Angular. What do you use? Spring and Angular. And I went to a new team and said, let me guess, you use Spring and Angular. Like, How do you know? And I asked them, why is it Spring and Angular? And they said, what do you mean? I said, why, why are you using Spring They said, I don't understand your question. I start a project, they tell me, use Spring and Angular, we use it. Well, at some point, we have to ask the question, are those the right technologies to use? Maybe they are. But did we ask that question? So we need to evaluate, right, and ask, is this the right technology? If we don't, and if the needs of the application are different than what they solve, now we got a bigger issue. We're trying to fit this into it. Honestly, I actually worked on a project for a client where we used Angular. And within Angular components, we were using React. Sometimes that can be the case, right? So ask the question, what problem are you trying to solve? So will React give a better performance? It depends. And it depends on what problem you're trying to solve and at what layer. But if we understand how the technologies actually work, then we are not trying to fight the wrong fight. We're not trying to solve the problem at the wrong level. Take the time, profile things, understand how things actually work beyond simply saying, use this and you get this. Here's the input, here's the output. Uh, encapsulation doesn't work too well in this case, right? Your knowledge has to be, again, going back to the wonderful quote I've heard people say, you should know one level below the level of abstraction that you're working with. If you know one level below the level of abstraction you're working with, honestly, I, I, I mean this. Because when I program in Java, I won't tell you how many times I take a peek at the bytecode. I do. I want to go in and see how it works. When I program in C++, I dive in and take a look at the V table. When I program in C sharp, I go and take a look at the, uh, the, assembly, the um, IL code, uh, the intermediate language code. I'm, I'm curious what's happening below because that gives me the command of knowing how things work. Similarly, when I look at React and when they say, hey, go ahead and call the set state and it's going to render it, I'm like, I want to know what that means. I want to know how the rendering works. How does the virtual DOM replacing the DOM really do the job? Knowing those things help us to know what we are sitting on top of. And when somebody says, do this, you would say, nope, that's not going to work. And they're like, why not? The right answer is, go ahead and try. Do a prototype. And they come back to you in two hours and say, okay, it didn't work. Let's talk about why it didn't work. Right? You get the command of that. And you're able to really direct the teams to the right, right use of technology rather than being fearful of it. 
and that can be very helpful as well. Hope that was useful. That's all I have. Thank you.